Welcome to the KDB From the Tap podcast. I'm executive editor, Chelsea Butler. This week, I am welcoming Mindy O'Connor, principal of Philadelphia-based Melinda Kelson O'Connor Design. She's gonna talk to us about tackling issues that arise during kitchen and bath projects. Be sure to subscribe to KBB's YouTube channel and click the like button on our videos. You can also subscribe to KBB's From the Tap podcast on such apps as Apple, Spotify, Pandora, and Google Podcasts. And please feel free to leave a review. Welcome, Mindy, and thank you for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Great. So why don't we start out with you telling us a little bit about yourself and your firm? Sure. Um, I'm an architect and with a practice that specializes in residential architecture and interior design. Um, I focus on high quality, sustainable design minded projects, mostly in the Philadelphia area. Um, I'm located in and live and work in Chestnut Hill, which is a neighborhood in Philadelphia that has a really long history and lineage of great historic architecture and modernist architecture. So it's a really lovely place to be connected to. Um, I share actually my office and collaborate with a similar small um, like-minded firm, uh, HSK Architecture. So this model really works for me because I can stay small and nimble with my own projects and the small architecture and interiors projects. And then we collaborate in kind of a collective on the larger projects and it lets me take on kind of a different range of work. Um, but I do work in a lot of older homes and this area of Philadelphia has a ton of historic housing stock that are large homes that often need significant you know, gut renovations, additions, um, and remodels. And I do a lot of residential work in that space. Um, all right. So yeah, lots of experience with what we're going to be talking about today. Yes. Um, All kitchen and bath. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know that you have some interest in sustainability. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I've been interested in a long time and was lead accredited way back in 2009. But I think that, you know, for me, um, I think anyone who's working in the built environment with buildings in any capacity kind of has a responsibility to be interested in this. I mean, building buildings emissions are, I think, responsible for something like 40% of global emissions. And in Philadelphia alone, 70% of our emissions are in the building sector. So that could be operational energy. Um, what it takes to heat and cool and light the buildings are also embedded energy, which is what it takes to, you know, construct buildings and the materials and labor. So for me, it's just, it can't really be buzzwords of sustainability and resilience and, and, or like added feature. It's not something we add on. I just think it's got to be intrinsic to what at this point in time is good design, um, because it's just important and there's no other way that we're going to improve those numbers if we're not collectively focused on it. Um, and also, you know, it's one of the reasons I really like working in older homes because the most sustainable building is a building that already exists, right? So it's automatically sustainable. Um, and so that's really appealing. And then being able to reimagine um, and remodel those buildings and try to inject the most, you know, energy efficient um, methods we can into, into them is really, it's, it's fun and it's exciting. And I think it's what we should be doing. So it's not that those are the only projects that I work on, but um, I do kind of have a special place for them <laughs> because okay. I think it's so important to try to reuse what is there. Yeah, um, I definitely agree. All right, well, let's talk about our first issue that might arise during projects. And that is, you know, the stuff that can be, be happening behind the walls, things that can arise during demolition. Talk to us a little bit about that. Sure, uh, I refer to it and refer to it upfront in my project agreements as concealed conditions, which is one of the formal term for it. But um, I think it's really important, especially if you're working in older homes, like I do, to make people aware, clients aware from the very beginning that this is just not something that you are going to be able to avoid by the best planning. You know, even the best builders, architects, and designers are not 
they don't have x-ray vision and they're not clairvoyant. So we cannot know what we can't see. We can suspect from experience. Um, but I try to really lay that out, you know, what's going to happen when we find those things that it's not automatically budgeted for in the project budget. And we really recommend people leave a contingency like five to 10% of their project costs in anticipation of what you might find. Um, because you will almost always find something. It's rare that you won't. And it's not always a big deal and it's not always expensive to remedy, but it's, I find people, um, roll with things much more easily when they have some awareness that this is likely to happen, or at least the possibility that it's going to happen. Um, you know, and I see stuff regularly when when we open up because the building has existed since you know the eighteen or early nineteen hundreds. It's likely to have things going on that are not going to be uh, appropriate for today. <laughs> Yeah, so can you tell us about some of the examples that you found in, in some of these properties? Yeah, sure. Um, there are some fun examples. I mean, we find often like great like six layers of wallpaper and you can see the design style and you can see the outline of where the wall was or a staircase you didn't know about was if you don't have the original plans. And that can be really fun. We found, I found crumbling letters from, you know, historic buildings with like really cool handwriting on them. Never really anything exciting inside yet. But, um, and I found uh, builders often used to sign the back of like built-in furniture. So sometimes you'll find signatures from the 1800s on the back of a built-in cabinetry piece. We have that happen, pulling it out to restore it. So that's the fun stuff you might find. Um, less fun stuff. Um, knob and tube wiring is a big one that's frequently um, behind the walls. We'll find asbestos line duct work that has to be addressed. Um, and then so a lot of structural issues can come up. So, you know, you'll see a column in a space that you think you're kind of seeing um, the gutted space. And then you're assuming that column is resting on something as it should do, like a foundation. And then you'll open up the wall for you know, to check and it's not, um, it's just not resting on anything substantial. So that's one that's happened before. And you just really would not expect that to be the case. Um, very often when we pull up a floor for a bathroom in an older home, we'll find um, structural members that have been just hacked away at by previous renovations in ways that they shouldn't have been. So you bring an engineer in and, you know, kind of sister the structure so that it's safe because it's not meant to have holes just chopped into it at every possible angle. So that's a really common one I think comes up a lot. And we anticipate often needing some funds aside for that. Um, one unusual one I had was in relocating a basement stair for a kitchen project, we went to excavate for the foundation for this tiny little stair and went under the basement slab to find that there was like four feet of uh, airspace and another floor under the basement slab. So that was odd. And, you know, it was kind of like, is this where the bodies are buried? Is That's what I was thinking. <laughs> there was a lot of speculation. Um, and ultimately, I think we figured out that it was an old sewer system that was no longer in use. It was a city thing and that ran right under the house and the, the neighborhood. So not know did not see that one coming and so we had to obviously reconfigure what we were doing um at the foundation level and you know then there's some dangerous stuff like this asbestos sometimes we'll have to get that remedied um fire grenades which they used to use in old buildings which are these glass orbs that would be filled with uh, what's a toxic kind of chemical that was meant to sort of explode on impact with heat and fire and then put the fire out <laughs> but instead they're just this kind of like dangerous glass globe of toxic stuff that has to be removed <laughs> so all yeah. kinds of things have come up yeah so do you i mean you know you, you would explain that ahead of projects and things like that you you do let your clients know that this is something that they need to plan on in their budget so it doesn't just come up as a complete shock right yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really one of, in our terms, it's really discussed. And I am really clear, I do really detailed project agreements and go through everything. So I like to think that most people, and I also think most people who are buying homes that are historic, I, you know, they're somewhat aware that this is going to 
could happen. And that is something that they might want to plan for. But we really like to spell it out and just talk about it with the builder, with them, so that um, they can be prepared. Another thing you can do as well, um, which I like to do for a number of reasons, is sometimes engage a contractor for pre-construction services. Um, so prior to doing a ton of the design work, sometimes it's helpful when a lot is not known about the project or there are no plans um, or a lot of history about it. They can do a little bit of exploratory, sign an agreement with the client that lets them get in there and dig around a little bit so that you can try to find some of these things. So before we design something with too many assumptions, if we're not sure, then that's a great way to try to get a little bit more information up front. But it's not, you're never going to know everything until you demo all, all of it. So do you plan for this in your in your project timeline as well? Do you add a little extra time just in case that's something that's like more dramatic? I mean, to some extent, but I think that largely the timeline at that point is set more by the builder. And I think everyone is aware these things come up. And I would say that generally, I don't find um, they take very long to remedy, uh, okay. typically. Sometimes like, the, the, you know, a structural column resting on nothing yes you're going to be bringing in things you weren't anticipating bringing in to support it but um a lot of them I mean they might add a week they might add a few days you know scheduling those companies but a lot of the builders that I work with you know have great relationships with people who come in and remediate the asbestos for example or um you know so usually um at least pre-pandemic times and still now it you can get people in pretty quickly to remedy them so it's more I think generally for me an expectation about the costs um, than it is really slowing down things to a dramatic uh, point. That makes sense, yeah. So are there any kind of structural issues that can arise with new builds? I'm not as familiar with those, but we did just cover a new build where the architect had allocated space for the kitchen, but the design team had to rework some areas to achieve like more visual symmetry, like some, Symmetry, like, you know, just walked in there. It was just kind of, here's where the main things are. Now go and make a space. So, well, I would say for me, I mean, I don't typically find myself in a space that is more or less worked out by an architect as a designer. And it's actually one of the reasons that I um, incorporated interior design into my architecture practice and, and really enjoy doing both so much is I just feel super strongly that it's um, all of the building process is interdisciplinary and that all of the people involved should be there up front. So whether I'm the interior designer or someone else is on my project, I want that voice involved in the beginning. And I think you avoid in new construction, it's much easier to avoid issues like that. If you're um, having a shared conversation and goals from the beginning, if symmetry is that important, then you know you'd want to like have that as part of the conversation and i also think that um for new buildings a really um good and experienced contractor can anticipate sort of um how joist locations might affect you know design decisions later on it's really i find when you're kind of moving at a fast pace and they're trying to get things done ahead of time and then you're kind of coming in after the fact to solve problems where with new construction where you might be faced with something like that but again i try to avoid it by having a really broad team up front all right, so let's pivot over to um, concerns you might have with clients, everything from meeting their expectations, preventing them from buying product online, changing minds. <laughs> Can you speak to those or any others that have come up during your projects and how you've been able to um, remedy those situations? Sure, yeah, so there were a few there. So, um, <laughs> well, Meeting expectations, I mean, again, back to like the very beginning, I like to meet with a client and really try to understand what they're looking to do, get to know them a little bit. And I write a really detailed proposal and agreement. And one of the reasons I like to do that is to um, not just say it, but define in writing what we're all talking about and make sure from the beginning, we're kind of speaking the same language. So after listening to them as well as I can, I like to reiterate in the proposal and the project agreement, not just what we're gonna do, but what their goals are, what the 
exact scope that they are interested in pursuing is and kind of set up this shared communication understanding from really just day one and let them confirm when they read it and go through it together that this is exactly what you said to me and what I'm hearing back to you and we're all on the same page. So I I have great clients and I find that like if you actively seek out people who are kind and interested in doing projects in that way that and talk about it up front really transparently that you can avoid a lot of the other things that you mentioned going forward. Um, and I think that, you know, it, sometimes that just means um, reworking that until we really are speaking exactly the same language. And I think from then you're establishing a lot of trust and good communication moving forward. Because I think uh, trusting relationships are really the way that this works the best. Um, as far as decision making and buying online, I mean, well, those are separate things too. I guess for purchasing, it goes back to me for what we've agreed upon that's going to happen. So if I'm doing an interior portion of the project for someone, I am super transparent and we are agreeing about, I will share my my net pricing with you and I will share what the pricing I'm going to add to it is and what my fees are and how I charge. And I just like to establish it all at the very beginning so that I'm never sending an invoice that is confusing or unclear about where the fees are going to be coming from. And then, then in that case, I expect to do the purchasing. Um, if I casually talk to them about something in their house and they want to buy, you know, something for their kid's room that's not part of our scope, uh, you know, I'm happy to, to watch them go and buy things online. But um, generally, it's really spelled out in my contracts. And on the architectural side, I really try to encourage people, like you can find anything online. Now you could find every plumbing fixture or light that you want to purchase for a project. You can find probably a better price for it online than you might get from a builder. Um, but I really try to explain to people why I feel like that you should let the um, contractor or their subcontractors purchase for you at the prices that they're presenting to you. Um, because if you buy something and something is wrong with it when it arrives, it's not just that you're responsible for returning it. Um, which of course you have to do, but it's also that if you buy a fixture and the plumber installs it and you purchased it and then they install it and it doesn't work because it's defective, then um, not only do you have to return it, the plumber has to come back and reinstall it. And that tends to be at your cost to you because you've purchased it. When they purchase it, um, that is baked in and that is why they're adding to those costs. And I think it's really valuable and I don't think anyone really has time to do that and I, I really prefer that um, everyone understands why they're adding costs and so then it becomes I think less tempting to try to save $40 or $100 on one item and then you know end up in a situation where you're paying a professional to come back two or three times to fix something and if they're ordering it you're not even involved in that it just happens for you right. which is really great, you know, when that's happening. And I would say, particularly now, um, there are almost no projects where something doesn't come damaged in the wrong finish, um, you know, with an issue. It's really rare that you'll get through an entire project where nothing, you know, there, there are no imperfections in what's um, delivered. So I think it's even more important. Um, and I, yeah, I think, am I forgetting one of your, I think uh, decision-making is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, decision-making, I think is so interesting because I, there, I have all different types of clients and I like that way. Um, so it's not for me, I don't think of an indecisive client as a problem client or something that's going to bother me in our relationship. I think, again, it's about communication. Um, of course, there are people who, hire you because they want you to present them three choices and they don't want really to have anything to do with the design process and they want to decide and move forward and keep things moving as quickly as possible. And that's great. And I love that because, you know, they're just giving you full authority to do it and making decisions quickly. Um, and it works 
smoothly and that works really well for some people. But other people just think differently and have a different internal process. And I'm totally okay with that. I think there are just human beings that cannot decide things in one meeting. And so I don't tend to run my projects that like we are going to have one, you know, decision point about this. If you are the type of person that needs to revisit or see three or four iterations, I'm fine with that. Um, I look at it as collaborative. I want to learn from you and hear what you have to say. And some people really enjoy the process and that can be fun too. I think what I caution when that's happening is that, you know, this what is fun and enjoyable for you or required for you to make a decision is going to prolong the process. So, mm -hmm. you know, the subcontractors or whomever, you know, is installing is, is waiting on decisions and they will not wait around forever. So you just are, you know, elongating the time. Um, and I think that if you're comfortable that a longer decision-making process will, will, change the nature of your project in terms of when it will be delivered, then that's fine. But if you're not comfortable with that, we have to find ways to speed that up for you and make it happen. Uh, but I also think, you know, architecture and design are slow. They're slow moving endeavors and they're meant to be there for a long time. So I would really rather see my client feel good about the commitments and the decisions they're making. Um, even if they have to revisit them, not later on after all the decisions have been made, but um, as part of a lengthier design process, then I would have anyone rip out something a year after it was done. I mean, that just, I think, you know, is what we're trying to avoid. So I think if you take the whole thing, I try to remind people that this is, that the objective is for what you're creating to be there for a really long time. And this kind of gets back to the sustainability you know, point of view that it's okay also to be really sure that you're happy with the decisions. And if I need to draw it differently or show it to you differently or visualize it in a way that, you know, makes you sure, then I'm happy to do that. And I just make sure that our agreements just were compensated fairly for what we're doing and it's all good. All right. Yeah. Good stuff. I want to move over to I don't, I think it's maybe everybody's least favorite topic, but it's pretty popular right now. Um, <laughs> supply chain lead time issues. So what are some of your solutions for those scenarios? I know a lot of people I've talked to, obviously they're doing all, all sorts of things up front that they may have waited, you know, to do. Um, so I'm sure you all are doing the same ordering, you know, making, trying to make decisions faster. Um, but what are your solutions for that? Do you, do you, do you have to go with brands outside of your tried and true? Like what do, what do you all do? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's unprecedented. So obviously it's sort of a moving target and we've been honing this process now for two and a half years and trying different things. Um, and one of them is certainly, you know, taking a sort of backwards approach in terms of it, rather than deciding on the details at the end, you know, really upfront finding out what is available in this sort of range that we're looking at and then purchasing things and storing them. I mean, it is the safest way to go about it right now to know that you will get the exact thing that you wanted if it's specific. But again, not everybody can do that and not everybody can commit that way um, really, really far in advance. I mean, sometimes you could be talking about a year and a half before this is going to be installed somewhere. Um, so other things that we do i mean one comes down to relationships um some brands have been reliable but i find that that again is a moving target and it changes so and it keeps shifting so i find it's easier to create really good relationships with the suppliers so that you can call them at different stages in the process and just find out what the state of things is at that moment and what your best bets are going to be and try to work from there and, you know, pivot when you need to. I also think um, trying to leave a little bit of uh, wiggle room for yourself and the design. So some things are easier to adjust later. So if we don't know exactly what fixtures we're going to be able to get or use, then maybe I'm going to, instead of designing the cabinet to be extremely tight to one particular thing, you know, maybe we make it a little bit larger and, you know, leave 
some flexibility in the design and we can adapt the space to a few different, you know, fixtures that might work, things like that. Um, and just really communicating to people that we're probably going to have to pivot at some point on some item or more and just really showing multiple options and not getting kind of too focused on any one um, thing if we don't actually have it secured sitting in a storage space somewhere. Um, so I think it's just is having a really broad mindset about it and constantly checking in because every time I've not checked in and made sure that things I thought were available or that I was told were available, um, they end up disappearing. So I think just really trying to connect consistently with all the providers and find out kind of a snapshot as you go through the process until you're really ready for the purchase. And even then, sometimes when you purchase, you know, the, the delay happens after that. So until it's in hand, you have to be ready to, to move things around. Um, but I think it's a certain need improving from you know a couple of years ago just in the sense that everyone involved has is that practiced at maneuvering around it right now um so i think there's a lot less um panic and even clients i think are aware coming in to a much bigger degree now that they're going to be waiting for some items or changing what they wanted to do in order to only work with things that are in stock so you mentioned that, um, you know, where there might be a brand that you used a lot and it was reliable and you, you know, available and all that good stuff. And then that can always change as well. It just doesn't, it's kind of hitting all over the board at this point. Um, is there any advice that you could give to a brand? Just like, you know, I'm sure they're, you know, having their own set of heartaches at this point, but yeah. like, it's, I, I don't know if there's anything you can tell them that would that would make it more helpful for people to like stay on point with them or what they can do with their design pros to make things easier. Yeah. I mean, I think some brands have done a really good job. I think again, it's always communication, right? And so it's, I mean, we all understand that if you're wherever your production is, is going to affect what's happening and wherever you're shipping things in from in, in, in there may not be a super, high amount of control about that, but what they can control is what they're telling people and um, the more specific they can be. And if that's unknown, then be specific about that. Like I, the worst is if you're given what seems like a solid date and a confirmation that something is gonna be there or happen or be available and then it's not. So if you understand that they really don't know, sometimes that's the best thing because you can say to a client, how much do you love this? Is this something you want to wait for no matter when it's available? Or did you not really care that much and we probably can't rely on this date? Um, so, and I think having access to it upfront online, I have some fixture brands are just posting for specific finishes. You know, this is six to eight weeks. This is 10 to 12 weeks. This is, and the more places that do that, then you can really quickly kind of figure out what your options are in some projects have a lot of time to spare and it's okay and others don't. So I think it's helpful. Um, the more information that is they can put out, the better. And if they don't feel like it's accurate, then you just tell people that. And I think I find with my own clients for my own work, uh, people are generally nice and understanding when you when they know something is happening and when you've explained why. And it becomes less that way when they thought something was going to be a certain way and it's not, or they didn't know that there was an issue and then it appears magically out of nowhere. So if everyone is kind of brought along at the same pace as to what's happening, you know, I think people tend to roll with it because everyone is aware of what's happening in the world. So it's not, you know, uh, it, it's understandable to some degree and, and, everybody recognizes that, I think, when they're made aware. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I know you've provided some great solutions to, you know, everyone's challenges. I know it's a lot busier right now and a little bit more challenging than it has been in years past. And 
who knows what will happen in the next couple of years. Right. <laughs> um, but I think it's just, just kind of a moving target and it's always good to have designers, you know, be able to kind of discuss what they're doing out there to make things easier on themselves, their clients and everything. So I appreciate you taking your time today with us. Sure, thank you so much. It's nice to chat with you.